Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Deron Chavis. I'd like to welcome you all to Afroecology. Today, we will be immersing you in a wide variety of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, cross-cultural ideas, techniques. The um, goal of the day is to inspire, uh, to raise awareness, and to reconnect those in attendance to the ideas of ecology from an African perspective. We will have uh, poets. We have Tanisha Carter, uh, who will be performing for us today. We also have Andrea Nicole and Franz, who will be performing as well. But the meat and the soul of today is dedicated to the idea of black agriculture, uh, black ecology, uh, so I have several of my friends, colleagues, that will be joining me throughout the day and we'll be having a dialogue. This is intimate, casual, purely for the sake of, I don't know, uh, communicating these ideas that may be foreign to some, uh, uh, rooted for others, and a reminder for those who may need the reminder. Um, before I begin, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am an activist, I'm an advocate, I'm a, a farmer, I am a gardener. Um, I just consider myself to be a person that connects things, connects dots, connects concepts, specifically for the purpose of liberating people of African ancestry in the city of Richmond throughout the state of Virginia, nationally and globally. I came into this work around activism as a museum coordinator for the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia. And while at the museum, our work centered around telling the story of people of color, telling the stories of people of African ancestry, specifically in the city of Richmond, but expanding that narrative and changing the narratives of which we are familiar. So I, I would every day wake up and go to work to give tours to children, you know, elementary school, middle school, you know, to adults, to senior citizens even, from, to people from across the state, from across the country, you know, across the world, people that visited Jackson Ward. And it was in that space that we found that there was a lot of work that we need to do to reconnect people of color to their legacies, to the concepts, the ancestral wisdom, to the legacy of greatness, of excellence that has been incarnate in the story of people of African, African ancestry since the beginning. Um, in 2003, we were right on the eve of the 50th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education. Brown versus the Board of Education was a landmark Supreme Court decision that desegregated public schools and across the country. What was important about that legislation or that, 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 that law or that, that, that court case was there was a piece of evidence that was entered in that for many who study Brown versus the Board was innovative, different, and really changed the conversation um, around why segregated schools was a problematic situation. Right? We already knew that there was separate but equal in African schools where people, schools that people of color attended did not have the same resources as their white counterparts. But this piece of evidence that was entered in was the Kenneth Clark Doll study. And Kenneth Clark was a psychology uh, expert, was a psychologist at this time, sociologist. And he had did research on African American children. And the research basically consisted of him taking dolls and asking children what did they think of the doll based on the color of the doll, black doll, white doll. 
do you feel like the black doll, what is what does the black doll represent to you? Children would say something like the black doll was ugly, right? The black doll was bad, right? The white doll was good, right? They want to be more like the white doll. And it was in this research that a conversation around inferiority complexes bubbled up to the top and how the system of white supremacy, systemic racism, institutional racism had created an inferiority complex in children of African ancestry that they looked at themselves condescendingly as a result of the system that had been created. So in 2003, we're on the, we were on the eve of this uh, 50th celebration, and I'm working at the Black History Museum and Culture Center of Virginia. And, you know, of course, this is all the rave. Everyone's talking about Brown versus the Board of Education, but very few people were talking about this kind of Clark doll study. And I, along with some other folks, talked about what can we do to highlight the importance of addressing inferiority complexes in the African community. One of the most, one of the easiest things that came about was that we could do an event. We decided that we would use the back parking lot of the Black History Museum to craft a festival. Uh, that festival would address and free to work complexes in the black community. We will also address health disparities in the black community. And it was in that moment that Happily Natural Day was born. Happily Natural Day was, or is, wrapped around the idea of cultural identity and celebrating the identity of people of African descent. Holistic health and wellness because it's not just about you know, whether or not there's a, there's not, it's not just about, you know, disease and disparity and diseases. It's also mental health. It's also economic wealth. It's the full person because we're not just our physical body. We're also our social body, our emotional body, our economic livelihood. All those things wrap up into a whole person. So we started a festival. And of course, you know, one of the easiest ways for us to engage in the conversation around inferiority complexes in the black community was point out the obvious things, right? Colorism, right? The idea of being of lighter melanin content and it allowing you access into numerous spaces in a white supremacist construct. Another was hair, right? How not just people of African ancestry, but all cultures that have encountered people of European ancestry were forced to assimilate into the European modalities, the European value system, the hierarchy of human value that ascribed white people at the top and everybody else at the bottom, right? So for that assimilation to take place, it meant that you had to denigrate some part of yourself. You had to take something away in order to fit into this structure. That looked like for people of color, brown paper bag tests, right? That said, okay, if you're lighter than a brown paper bag, then you can be a part of this other class of people of African ancestry that were able to access doors that had more opportunities, right? Um, it also looked like straight ink combs you know, in terms for the hair. Back in the day when Maggie, Madam C.J. Walker promoted her hair care products, she was overt in saying that, you know, you want to get lighter, right? You want to have straighter hair so that you can look more beautiful, right? These ideas of assimilating into a culture that had robbed, exploited, oppressed and destroyed and called everything that was not European savage, right? So we did the festival, music, right, poetry. We held workshops, had lectures, had vendors. And the spirit of the festival 
was something that had never been seen in the city of Richmond. It was very unique because it was something that was purely self-determining, right? This is something that was funded by people of African ancestry and developed for people of African ancestry and was on the terms of people of Af African ancestry from the beginning. And it was in that space that we met African-American farmers, right? And in the beginning, it was very intriguing because we would have these farmers come and they would bring their produce, right? You know, they would bring their truck and they would have goat beans and things like that. And simultaneous to us having a conversation around identity, we were having a conversation around self-reliance, right? And these farmers, engage me as the organizer, and we would have conversations. Um, why is it important for us to know where food comes from, right? Who grew it? You know, we take it for granted. You go to the grocery store, there's frozen broccoli, right? But who grew the broccoli? You know, how did it get to the grocery store? And, you know, for a while, I just would talk to them and learn from them and hear from them and, you know, I'm internalizing these things and I'm 25 and it's really hard for me to understand why or at least feel comfortable with having a conversation about what I do if the grocery store is closed, right? At the time, my sons were like three and two years old and, you know, you ask a young father, you know, what are you going to do if the grocery store is closed? How are you going to feed your family? And it's kind of like, whoa, this is heavy. I don't know, I don't know what I'm gonna do, right? I have no clue, to be honest. But you don't wanna say that as a man and a family, right, as a provider. You don't wanna say, I don't know what I would do if there was nowhere for me to buy food for my family. So later, we started connecting with the farmers on a more intimate level. We started doing pop-up shops, selling produce in areas that have been designated as food deserts, you know, Church Hill, North side. We started doing these markets. And it was in those Saturdays where I sat with a man that was old enough to be my grandfather, where I realized that there was a, an entire world that I had not been introduced to. This man, his name was Salim Ahmed. His name is Salim Ahmed. He'd shake his hand and he'd be like, wow, this man, he's you know, he don't look like he's 75, but he's been growing food his entire life, right? And he talked to me about when to plant, right? How you need to plant your seeds when the moon is full because that's when the earth is drawing up the water from its deepest levels, and that's when, you know, it's the opportune time for you to plant seeds. And it was like, oh man, this, ain't, this is old stuff. This is ancient wisdom. We talk about the difference between, you know, organic seeds and heirloom seeds and, you know, how the USDA discriminated against African-American farmers. And, you know, it was for me like, whoa, I'm getting this whole other education. And I started to feel guilty because we were relying on a man the age of my grandfather to bring produce into the city every weekend. And if something would have happened to him, the program would have stopped. So it was in that moment around 2012 where I started my first garden, inspired by these farmers that had connected as a result of the work that we have done around cultural identity and self-determination through Happily Natural Day. So this threat of self-reliance, this thread of community efficacy, this thread of doing for ourselves has woven a narrative for me and also for the conversation around food justice in the city of Richmond, where inherent in our conversation around who has access to food and who doesn't is a conversation about race. Today's Afroecology is inspired by that story. So, this is gonna be easy, this is gonna be clean, this is gonna be amazing. Um, I just wanted to share what inspired this um, as the beginning of today's affair.
Uh, you're gonna get a lot out of this afternoon. There's a lot of a lot of talent that's gonna be sharing and a lot of thought wisdom that's gonna be sharing. Um, stay tuned. We're gonna be bringing up Tanisha Carter and we'll spark it off in a few moments. Thank you. Welcome to Afro Ecology.